the fuel control monitor. We're going to take some time here to go in depth of some stuff. Let's talk about when you do this test. You suspect a fuel control or delivery problem and you want to go beyond routine diagnostics. What you've been trying has not worked. Now it's time to back up and to do a very in-depth study. And the diagnostic tools we're going to use or scan tools will be used. But we're going to obtain the maximum information available. We're going to see how it is to get a diagnostic direction by taking the time to really study scan data to make you stop and think about the relationship between those age-old sensors like MAP, TPS, mass airflow, inlet air, and make you stop and think about what's going on and how they relate to the diagnostic directions. Let's start and see what it's going to be like to go back and really review stuff we've been working with for years. Now it's time to start talking about fuel control, fuel delivery. Fuel control is the fuel calculation for proper air-fuel ratio. When we make these calculations, if they're wrong, the PCM will make fuel trim adjustments. And we're going to talk about why these can be wrong and exactly how we look at them. Input sensors to the PCM. What is it used to make these calculations? We need to be aware of those because we can get a diagnostic direction. Remember, one of our things we want to stress all through this program is when you take a reading, we want you to get a diagnostic direction from that reading. Now the other side of it is fuel delivery. It's the mechanical side of the system. It's the fuel pump, the lines, the filter, the pressure regulator. Are we getting the right volume? Are we getting the right pressure? And if we are, the PCM output, the injector, is going to be commanded to be open for a specified amount of time. Now, if this injector opening delivers the wrong amount of fuel, we're going to go back and adjust the fuel trims to return the system back to a normal air-fuel ratio, which we're going to assume in this program to be 14.7 to 1 for research-grade gasoline. We know you may be using ethanol, E85, you may have 10% ethanol, you may have whatever, but we're looking for a 14.7 for the basis of this course. Now, the fuel monitor is one of the continuous tests that runs whatever the engine is running. It is entirely in software and monitors the fuel trims. Now, we need to define these fuel trims. Fuel trims refer to total fuel trim. Total fuel trim is the combination of short and long term. And don't forget, many vehicles use post catalytic converter sensors to modify total fuel trim. If the sensor after the catalyst sees a long term shift, rich or lean, it will then come back and modify total fuel trim. Now fuel control is when the PCM determines how much air is entering the engine. It then calculates how much fuel is required based on conditions. Fuel delivery is simply a matter of the PCM commands an injector pulse width, IPW, and the amount of fuel is delivered that is dependent upon the ability of the mechanical side to produce it. Are the injectors clean? Is the pressure right? Is there enough volume to maintain that pressure during the injection pulses? There are two common ways to look at fuel control. And you have to have an understanding of each of these. It's going to allow you to diagnose most of the vehicles that end up in your service bay. We've got MAP sensors and mass airflow. We're going to break each one down so you understand what these inputs are because they have drastically different problems. And we've got to talk about the problems because this is an area where we frequently have major malfunctions. We'll talk about that. The speed density method is going to be calculated air entering the engine. It is not measured. It's based purely on a calculation. First and foremost, the calculation is going to use engine load. We're going to talk about what makes up engine load in a moment, but let's just say it's engine load, engine speed, air density, ambient air pressure, barometric, and the engine temperature. All of this combined together and it's going to help us calculate it. If there's one of these readings are wrong, it's going to throw off our calculation slightly. That's the point we're trying to make. Remember, all through this program we're trying to give you a feeling of the right diagnostic direction to take when you take a reading. So understanding these will help give you a diagnostic direction. 
Engine size and volumetric efficiency is the final thing. This should not change unless there's severe engine wear or changes in the engine. Breaking it down, RPM, load, air temperature, all equal to air density. Engine RPM is determined by the crankshaft position sensor. And it answers another question. When does a PCM need to add fuel? Fire an injector. How often? How frequently? This is going to be determined by engine RPM. The engine load is measured by the MAP sensor, determines how much fuel should be added. Now this is the predominant thing. The air temperature is measured by the inlet air temperatures, tells us how dense the air is. Someone once told me in when I was teaching in Phoenix that 120 degrees in Phoenix has the same air density as 70 degrees in Denver, 5,000 feet higher. So, giving you an idea, it does have an impact. Pay attention to air density. Air pressure is again measured by the MAP sensor. How, if we're starting in Denver and it's 120, we're then about 10,000 feet high in air density. So, you have to keep in mind that these two work together. It is used to correct fuel quantity, pulse width. Air temperature affects air density. Cold air is more dense. 70 degree is used for zero correction typically. Higher temperatures results in less fuel to compensate for lower air density. Lower air temperature, more fuel is needed for higher density. Bad readings can affect the PCM attempts to keep it at the ideal fuel ratio proportions. Engine temperature is measured at the coolant sensor and this is going to run our automatic choke. We're going to be very rich for cold temperatures, lean out for higher temperatures. Now the engine size is a factor programmed in the PCM and the volumetric efficiency. Let's break this down a piece at a time. We got a MAP sensor input. We're going to talk about what should be the normal value later on, but we're going to have a value that's going to tell the PCM what it's going to be doing. It's going to look at the crankshaft position sensor to see how often it should be firing the injectors. And it's going to look at inlet air temperature to make modifications. If we have B plus connected to our fuel injector and we have a good ground at the PCM saying it's time to inject fuel, we're going to get a basic injector pulse width. If that's wrong, what does it mean? Diagnostically. If you have a major fueling problem, the injector pulse width is incorrect. What's your diagnostic direction? What first step should be looked at? Think about that. If we're going to get a diagnostic direction from every reading, we look at IPW. Question we have to ask, is inlet air temperature major or minor fuel trim? Minor. Crankshaft position tells us how often to fire the injector. The map in this particular case is going to tell us how much to fire. So if injector pulse width is incorrect, we go toward the map. You need to answer this question every time you start making a measurement. This is our talk about making sure you understand and get a diagnostic direction from a reading. Does the PCM know what the correct injector pulse width should be? This is a question you need to answer. If it doesn't know what it should be, we've got to have data wrong. When the PCM looks at it, it's going to use the oxygen sensor to modify the basic injector pulse width by using additional inputs. The TPS, the coolant, the park neutral switch, the AC, short-term, long-term fuel trim, fuel composition, and other accessories. Fuel composition is important. I know not many people buy and, and utilize E85 these days. It's becoming more and more common. But in a lot of cases, it's not being used as often as we think. But whether or not your customer buys E85, it is going to affect injector pulse width. The fuel compensation sensor is going to tell the PCM what basic pulse width to use. It is often overlooked. Why? We much need a much richer E85 mixture than we need gasoline. If we are running E85 and we don't measure it, we will have much too rich, much too lean of a mixture. If we're down where we're running gasoline and we think we've got E85, we're going to have much richer 
mixture than we expect. So stop right here and ask yourself some questions. Do you ever pay any attention to this fuel composition sensor? That's first question. Second question, do you check to see if your customer has been buying E85 for their regular fueled car? More and more we're finding customers which purchase E85 because it's 40, 50 cents a gallon cheaper even though they are not equipped with a flex fuel sensor and the vehicle can't operate properly. If they're putting in high content alcohol gas, it's going to cause a lean condition. There's some very inexpensive test kits for measuring alcohol concentration and I think most of the test kits also come with a reed vapor pressure measurement so you can check for winter grade, summer grade fuel. Don't forget, in this whole conversation, we have to stop and talk about fuel composition somewhere. And we have to stop and talk about the fuel composition sensor. If we don't, you can frequently go down the wrong road because you're assuming you have no alcohol in the fuel. That is not necessarily true. And too often, we assume the fuel composition sensor is telling us the right thing. Remember, a wrong reading there is going to change the air-fuel ratio target the PCM is using, which will drive a new pulse width. So mass airflow actually measures the air entering the engine. It has a lot more authority than the MAP sensor. What does that mean? Well, one of the things we see when we have a MAP sensor, you will find that TPS changes make big differences in injector pulse width. When you have a mass airflow, you'll notice that changes in TPS have a much smaller impact because they expect to see those changes show up in the airflow readings. It's mounted in the intake path and should measure all of the air entering the engine. What does that mean? It means any leaks after this is not going to be measured by the mass airflow and will result in lean fuel mixtures. Why? There's more air entering the engine than was measured. Unmeasured air will give you a lean mixture. It measures the specific weight of the air in pounds per grams per second, pounds per hour, pounds per second. Grams per second, I think, is the most frequently used thing. The PCM is going to match the incoming air. We're going to add 14.7 to, to 1 ratio of air and fuel. 14.7 pounds of air, 1 pound of fuel. That's our air-fuel ratio for gasoline. So the mass airflow is going to put it in. We're going to look at the crankshaft. It's going to tell us how much and when. Then we're going to go down and we're going to modify it with TPS, ECT, park neutral, AC, short-term fuel trim, long-term fuel trim, fuel composition. We keep saying that because we want to remind you to pay attention to how much alcohol is in your customer's tank. Don't assume it's all gasoline anymore. For the PCM to command the correct fuel injector pulse width, it must have the correct input information. To begin the diagnostics, stop and decide. Where do you start? At speed density? Do I start at map? Yeah, that's a good starting spot. Because these are kind of listed in their order of importance. Map, crank, inlet air, barrel, ECT. Errors on the map sensor can cause major problems in fuel delivery. Same on the maps, mass airflow side. Mass airflow sensors can cause major things there. So start and look there. Which sensors can cause a major fuel calculation? You need to answer that. We want you to think about this to get a diagnostic direction of where to go. We want you to be able to answer which sensors must be working normally for the PCM to make a correct air fuel calculation. This is the time to decide what all the scan data is pointing to. We stress studying the scan data to get all of the data. What are the diagnostic trouble codes? Does mode 6 data show any failures? We're going to give you a little preview about how fine mode 6 breaks these failures down. You get many more codes to give you an idea of what's going wrong with oxygen sensors in mode 5 or 6. Most frequent it's in mode 6 for domestic vehicles. 
You're going to get a history of trouble codes. What's been going on in the history? What else is failing? Are there any pending trouble codes? Go to the freeze frame information to find the operating conditions that occurred the first time the, the, set, the code set. Remember, if it's a freeze frame for fuel control, it's going to overwrite any pending codes. That's why I go back and look at history. History might tell us there were some other codes there before we got fuel. But fuel will overwrite any existing codes other than misfire.